Country music has its roots in telling stories from rural America. And for those of us who love country music, it's easy to notice that those stories are rarely ever told by our voices. But a new generation of black country music artists are emerging. Early on, it was Charlie Pride and later Darius Rucker. Today, artists like Kane Brown, Jimmy Allen, and Miko Marks are bringing something fresh and new to this great genre of music. Well, today I have the pleasure of introducing you to the first black female country artist to perform at the Grammys. She's also going to tell us about her new debut album called Remember Her Name. I always say, like what you like. I also say, be who you are. My next guest is doing just that. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Mickey Guyton. With a New York City life and a hotel Bible. Hand me down, Taylor made Daisy Dukes, Dookie Prince, James Brown, and James Dean. For cold beer, champagne, millionaires, fast and changing everything. Mickey, 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 your debut album, Remember Her Name, is an out-of-the-park home run. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank and you. I, Mickey, I have good taste. <laughs> yeah, <you do. laughs> Mickey, when you went into this studio, what did you want to accomplish? You know... I wanted to accomplish just giving people hope. I have gone through a lot over the last 10 years and I've learned a lot of lessons and I wanted to express that in an album to hopefully, you know, make people feel good and, and have hope in such an interesting time. What, what lessons have you learned? You know, I've learned one of the most important lessons that I've learned is, is true self-acceptance. Um, in life, I've been such a people pleaser and, and trying to be what I thought people wanted me to be. And instead of just learning to love exactly who I am. And, and that's a huge lesson for me. And, and I hope that I can help other people do that as well. What was it like when you were in the studio writing songs? Uh, uh, tell me about that whole process for you. So I, I wrote a lot of the album... Well, not a, about half of the album during the pandemic. So I was writing within the four walls of my house on Zoom. And a lot of times my writing process was after I had written Black Like Me and my other song, What Are You Gonna Tell Her? I was trying to figure out how to bridge all of this together. And so I just, a lot of times wrote what I was seeing outside my window. I live in downtown Los Angeles. so during the pandemic, there was also all the racial unrest and I was literally watching it outside my window, heavily pregnant as well. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, that was kind of my writing process and how I recorded my producer all the way in Nashville, we discovered how to record via Zoom. So we would, we would call each other on Zoom and there's a, a feature on your computer where you can um, 
give the person on the other end remote control over your device. So she could literally control my computer via Zoom and turn on my logic session. And I had my, all of my recording equipment and we recorded via Zoom and this um, app called Audio Movers so we could hear it live. And that's how we recorded this entire album. <laughs> uh, were there songs that didn't make the cut? Were there songs that were, that you were surprised that did make the cut? Yes, there are a lot of songs that didn't make the cut that I love, that I want to, to put on the next record. Just some of them thematically didn't necessarily make sense for the album. Um, there were some songs like Higher. I wrote that song at the very end and I was just like, this song is just so cool. Let's, let's, it, it just gives something. I, I feel like people need to hear that. So I, I added it. Uh, Mickey, black people were not supposed to like country music. I didn't get that memo. I <laughs> liked it from the beginning. And you, me too. <laughs> you did not get that memo either. Tell I me, did not get that memo. <laughs> tell me about your experience down that path. Well, my grandma loved Dolly Parton. And whenever I would go over her house, I would see Dolly Parton and Kenny Rogers VHS tapes hanging on the back of her wall, along with Steel Magnolias, along with Fried Green Tomatoes, Southern Movies, along with Hope Floats, and along with the Roots VHS collection on the back of her door. And so when I would go over her house, that's what I watched. And... I also um, went to a Texas Rangers baseball game when I was a little girl and I heard Leanne Rimes before Leanne Rimes was Leanne Rimes sing the national anthem. And I remember I, she was close to my age and she sounded like a grown woman talk singing. And I wanted to do that. Like it didn't, it didn't resonate to, with me that she sang country music. I just thought she had a great voice. And in the nineties, there were so many women, no matter what genre you were in that had incredible voices. Um, let's talk about incredible voices. Can you remember the first person who told you you could sing? Yes, my dad. My dad was the first person that discovered I could sing. What did he say? Well, I remember I was probably like eight years old and, you know, I'm a, come from a Southern family, a Southern family that grew up in the church. Like that was church was our life. And there was this song. I can't remember the, the gospel song that was that my dad made me stay up late one night and sing with him. And I remember I, I was so annoyed. I had a piece of paper with the words written out that I was reading and singing and so annoyed with my dad because it was way past my bedtime. And he's having me stand in the kitchen singing this song and saying, this baby can sing. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't know that that's what I was going to want to do in life, but it eventually became what I wanted to do. Let me ask you a question I'm sure you've heard before. Why not R&B? Why not pop music? Why country music? I, I love the storytelling of country music, or I love the storytelling of country music. Like there's just something that I just thought was so beautiful about that. And that I loved, I loved listening to the stories and it was just what I was brought up around and, and I just, I loved it. But I also loved R&B and I also loved pop. I remember when I covered the CMAs, I covered 16 of them. It was me and Charlie Pry. <laughs> when you looked around the room. That was what's it. it been, <laughs> what's it been like for you? Well, First, before there was me, there was a woman named Reese Palmer. And she was the reason when I decided that I wanted to pursue a, a country music career, 
I saw Reese and I thought, oh, I can do this then. Like she's there. And before her was Linda Martell. And, you know, it's been a beautiful, difficult, challenging, amazing journey now that I'm finally being able to put out a record. It was hard. It, there, I battled a lot of things. Um, I had a lot of self-acceptance issues because you're in a predominantly, let's face it, you're in an all white industry. It, it is all white. And to be a black woman in that and and all the girls have blonde hair and blue eyes, or they're brunette with blue eyes. They're, they're <laughs> something, you know, and I didn't fit that, that look. And so that was really, really difficult for me to try to navigate. Um, but now I'm just, I'm so excited that I'm, I'm black and singing country music and that I can open the doors for other black girls that want to sing something besides just R&B, which is where often that's where we are put. Let's talk about the song Black Like Me. That's a song that drew me in to you. That's a song that introduced me to you. I saw you sing it on the Grammys in front of zillions of people. Right before you went on, were you nervous? What went uh, through your mind? I was so nervous. I was also I had just had a baby a month prior to that. <laughs> and so what was nice? People who don't perform in front of, of this huge audience, they have no idea. We're just sitting home watching you on TV. And we think great song, great performance, but you actually have to pull it all. <laughs> I just can't fathom that. My dad always says, get through the first verse and chorus and you'll be fine. And it's true. Like you're super nervous that first verse and chorus. Like you're like, your microphone is shaking. That's why a lot of times I don't even want to hold the microphone because if anybody gets in there close, like my little hand is shaking. And, but it's truly, once you get through that first verse and chorus, if you just continue on the nerves ease and then you're in it and you're ready. It's nerve wracking, but that's, it's a good thing when you're nervous. Cause when you're nervous, that means you care. Uh, Mickey, I want to bring up a couple of names. Uh, Garth Brooks, my guy, Garth Brooks has been, he's been very accepting of people of color. He's yes. also, uh, his sister for years played with him. She's gay. Um, Garth, I can't, I can't say enough good things about him. What do you say about Garth Brooks? You know, I think Garth Brooks, first of all, is such a kind person. He and Trisha, like Trisha Yearwood is just truly a phenomenal woman. And both of them, you lead with love. And I think that that is just so important in this genre. And he came at a time where that ain't country music. He's not country music. And he defied all odds. And he's such an inspiration to me in that way, that he defied the odds and, and pushed the envelope. And I just think that that's so cool. Mickey, I told you, this ring he gave me for the artists of the decade in, 19, in the 90s. One side is me, one side is him. Garth yeah. Brooks, one of my cherished possessions. Wow. <laughs> Seeing him in concert, he was the first country guy I saw put on a rock and roll concert. Mm -hmm. People would have hats, they'd stand there in front of the mic. Garth climbed up the... Uh, <laughs> a little, uh, he was and, like David, he's a performer. Yeah. Yep, yep. Okay, you mentioned Dolly Parton. Tell mm -hmm. me about her. 
Dolly Parton, man, one of my favorite songs that she's ever written was Coat of Many Colors. And the reason why I love that song so much is because growing up, my mom had these quilts of many colors and they were not beautiful quilts. The stitching was crooked. The patterns didn't match. Nothing made sense about these quilts. And I never understood why my mom kept these quilts. It turns out my grandmother um, was too poor. She had 12 kids and she was too poor to buy blankets at the store. So she would make blankets out of her clothes. And so those quilts are my grandmother's clothes. And that is why I love Dolly Parton so much. She is also someone who transcended the genre that she was so, so different and so accepted. She truly was talking about love and acceptance way back in the day. And I just thought that she was just so important to, to genre and she's still just as important today. And her songwriting is incredible. And she just, she was a woman that built a business with her, not just her music. Like she made a whole career and empire off of her songs. And I would, she wrote one of the most iconic songs in the world. I will always love you. And she's just, she's everything. Whitney Houston. What does Whitney Houston mean to you? Oh man, Whitney Houston means just to me, means as much to me as Dolly Parton. She was another woman that I listened to. Like I love, like I wanted to become a singer based off of the national anthem alone. <laughs> <laughs> I heard Leanne Ryan sing the national anthem. I heard Whitney sing the national anthem. And I both times when I heard them, it was just like, if there's a song to show a woman's voice, that is the song. And Whitney just slayed that. And then hearing her sing from the Bodyguard soundtrack, I Will Always Love You, and all of her songs from I Want to Dance with Somebody to, to um, what's that song? I Believe the Chil the Greatest Love of All. <laughs> she is everything and another huge inspiration for me. Let's talk about you being a brand new mom, Grayson. What was yeah. that like when you looked down and saw him in your arms? What did you think? Man, well, first of all, when I found out I was pregnant, I completely freaked out. I Why? Why? That, well, I found out I was pregnant um, the week or four days after I released my song, Black Like Me. And I was seeing this traction that I've never seen on any song that I've ever released. So I was like, man, this is it. Like I'm getting my chance and I'm <laughs> ready. You know, my body was ready. I was like working out. I was looking good. And then I found out I was pregnant. I was like, how do I do that? How does an artist, a new artist, become pregnant and have to, to be a new artist pregnant. I didn't know how to do that. And it was terrifying for me. And I mourned my former life. Like I didn't know what that looked like. But then as soon as I saw his face, it just changed everything. It was got, it was designed. It was, it was exactly what God wanted to happen. And it's, it's life-changing. It's, it's everything that I am every, for every moment, every heartbreak, every breakup, every, everything led to this baby. Like my life started when I had him. It's crazy. Your debut album is called Remember Her Name. As they say, you've done good. It's <laughs> a fine, fine record. I, <laughs> I just... I've been playing it and singing your song, singing along with you. Oh <laughs> it's God. been great. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. <laughs> well, thank you. I wish you all the best, my friend. Thank you. Sister Rosetta Tharp was born March 20th, 1915 in Cotton Plant, Arkansas. 
She gained popularity in the 30s and 40s with her gospel recordings. Her unique mixture of spiritual lyrics and electric guitar was extremely important to the origins of rock and roll. Rosetta Tharp was the first great recording star of gospel music and among the first gospel musicians to appeal to rhythm and blues in rock and roll audiences. Labeled the godmother of rock and roll, she influenced future rock and roll icons like Lil Richard, Elvis Presley, Chuck Berry, Johnny Cash, and many, many more. Her guitar playing was later cited by Eric Clapton, Jeff Beck, and Keith Richards. Sister Rosetta Tharp was inducted posthumously into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in May of 2018. She died October 9, 1973, in Philadelphia. She was 58 years old. I had a great time talking to Mickey Guyton. If you want to be part of the conversation, hit us up on Facebook and Twitter at All Things Men BNC. See you next time.